Thanks for listening to the Path Lab and Podcast, and this episode is sponsored by Weird Darkness. Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar, the creator and host of Weird Darkness, bringing you true stories of the paranormal, supernatural, unsolved, and unexplained. Get the podcast at WeirdDarkness.com or search for Weird Darkness in your favorite podcast app. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 podcast. I am your host, April Hanna, and we have a really great show today. We're going to be speaking to a medium, and her name is Austin Wells, but have a really cool story. Now, um, a little bit of synchronicity here. In episode 52, this is quite a while ago, we had interviewed an author by the name of Matthew McKay, and he wrote a book called Seeking Jordan and how I learned the truth about death and the invisible universe. And in this book, Matthew talks about a medium that really helped him connect with his son who had passed, his son being Jordan, and this is the medium that he is talking about in that book. So if you guys are compelled, I would say you might want to listen to this podcast and then go back and listen to episode 52 uh, to Matthew McKay's story, and then you'll be able to make the connection of the medium that he is speaking about in that podcast interview and also in his book. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Austin. She is a spiritual medium and soul gardener who empowers individuals to create soul-centered lives. In 2012, psychic medium John Edward invited her to host her own weekly show on his spiritual website, Infinite Quest. She has been the guest medium for the California State Spiritualist Convention, as well as a guest medium, presenter, and educator at many national conferences, including the Afterlife Awareness Conference and medium Robert Brown's Spiritual Retreat. Austin developed the Divine Spark Cards, which assist both developing mediums as well as grief counselors to inspire healing conversations with their clients. Her Divine Insight cards create simple, intuitive bridges to assist anyone who wishes to listen to the wisdom of their soul. She is featured in Matt McKay's book, Seeking Jordan, and in the Amazon book, Trust Within, The Heart of Intuition by Molly Carroll. Her first book, The Invisible Path of the Soul, will be published by New Harbinger's Reveal Press in the spring of 2019. So welcome, Austin, to the Path 11 podcast. We're really excited to have you here today. Thank you so much, April. I'm equally excited to be part of your world. And I love your site because I took a moment to kind of familiarize myself. And you've had some amazing guests. We have been very, very lucky, yes, to uh, speak to the wonderful people that have come on our show. Amazing guests. I would second that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for your interest in it because I think the conversations, whatever or however diverse they are, need to happen. So thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. And I was uh, letting our our audience know um, in the introduction that we had spoke to somebody that you also know, which is Matthew McKay. um, And you were also featured in that book, Seeking Jordan. So I was wondering if uh, maybe you might like to share just a a little bit about your work with Matthew um, to let our listeners who haven't listened to it already go back and take a listen to his interview as well. Um, Yes, there was a fantastically um, miraculous meeting that happened there. Um, his associate is, um, part of their publishing company, which is called new Harbinger. And, um, I had a read, a reading set up with his partner and I didn't realize, um, they were from the publishing company. And during the reading, uh, this young man stepped forward and I knew, I mean, let me clarify that this young man in the spirit world stepped forward to introduce himself to me to connect to the woman that I was reading. And he, I knew he wasn't like her son, but I knew that she had a very intimate relationship with him. And during the course of our reading, it became evident that he wanted to let his dad know that he really liked the way that they were working together and that he should complete the book. Well, the soul that I was talking to was George. Jordan and um, the, Matt's associate had started getting messages from Jordan, but she didn't really quite trust what was happening because she just was very you know, close with Matt. And so she didn't know if it was just her own imagination or if it was real. So the reading affirmed the fact 
that Jordan was bringing through messages. And the cool thing was that Jordan started bringing authors to them um, that they have now created a spiritual wing of New Harbinger, and I'm one of the new authors, and it's all because of Jordan. It's like crazy. It like started on the other side first, and then it became a reality here. Oh, wow. That's yeah. so cool. Oh, yeah. yeah and, <laughs> and that's right. You, you're working on a book, but it's not coming out until 2019. Is that correct? Right. It's 2019. It's called The Invisible Path of the Soul. And I have been so blessed. So Matt is by far like one of my earth angels because he and Catherine have been um, guiding me through the process of it. And it's it's been it's been a really long labor. <laughs> it's taken a while, but I'm so happy with the way that the book is forming. So, yeah, and it's really has everything to do with Jordan. So it's a perfect place to start. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Well, I'm not going to ask you too many questions about that because we're going to have to have you back on once that comes out and I get a chance to read it. Oh, um, I love that. Yeah. So, uh, I would love to know, you know, how your journey began with becoming a medium. Uh, many mediums that I have spoken to usually have some story that dates back to their childhood. So I'm not sure if that's when you began to notice things happening for you, but I'd like to hear more about that. Okay. Um, when I was five, so yes, childhood, absolutely. Um, I was in a fashion show and I was a little, uh, timid at that point in my life. And, um, I woke up in the middle of the night before the fashion show. And, um, my mom wasn't the kind of mom you woke up in the middle of the night to tell, to like ask for cuddling and stuff. So it helped me learn to be very independent. So I was just sitting up in my bed and praying and all of a sudden all these souls came in through like the walls started morphing and all these souls walked forward and uh, this one woman came to my bedside they were all translucent and although I'd never seen them before I wasn't afraid at all so this lady came up and didn't speak out loud she more spoke from soul to soul, which is really what mediumship is, and intuited to me, are you okay? And I expressed what I was concerned about. And then my room became two realities. So I was in my bed um, with this woman, but yet to my side, I could see the runway of the next day. And I literally was shown the entire event from beginning to end. And it also allowed me not only to notice that I was going to be fine, but also to feel the energy of the audience and to feel the support within the room of how much there, how much love was surrounding me. So I knew at that point there was absolutely no way I could fail. Um, even if I face planted, I was going to be fine. So then that, um, that picture kind of dissipated. And then I became back in my, I came back to my bed with the woman next to me. And once she knew I was fine, she just kind of disappeared and I fell asleep. Wow. What a gift <laughs> for well, them to come and soothe you and, oh, you know, yeah. And I mean, I mean, it was just such a blessing to be able to know at a young age that that kind of support is possible. And I think why, and I don't think people have to be mediums to have young experiences. I just think at that point, we're not so bombarded by the circumstances of our lives that we're more connected to the magic or the, the invisible parts of the world too. Right. So growing up, was this supported in your family or how did it begin to develop more and more throughout like the teenage years and, and so on? Um, my, I think my parents, as many parents do, thought I had an active imagination and I did. Okay. <laughs> so I give them, I give them a cookie for that one. Um, so it was, I, I kind of kept it in the background of a bit. And then my first boyfriend's mom was like my spiritual mom. So she was a Rosicrucian and she had tarot cards and she was just a playground of metaphysics. So when I was with her and spent time with her, she gave me the courage and the support to step into it more deeply. And then that really began the whole journey for me. Right. And now I also know that you're a certified grief counselor. Mm -hmm. So, and I, you know, obviously, you know, mediumship and grief counseling kind of go hand in hand. I think a lot of mediums, although they don't have the official title of being a therapist or a counselor, there's a lot of, you know, intimate counseling that is done. That's, 
I would say informal, right? But Abs- um, they, yeah. Absolutely. And April, I really appreciate you bringing that up primarily because I know your background has to do with, um, you know, being a therapist in your own right. So I think for you to recognize that component is absolutely key. I would not feel comfortable sitting in readings when I'm working with parents whose children are in the spirit world without an awareness of what the topography of grief is, because there, I mean, there really isn't a linear path to it at all. Um, and, but just to, to have the basics of what complicated grief looks like and when a person, like I had a client recently who mediumship wasn't at all what she needed. She really needed grief therapy because her Husband had died. Her son had crossed over in an accident. So she had two very significant losses in a short amount of time. And then she moved. So within she was she was having so much grief because there was nothing around her that reminded her of anything. Plus, she wasn't having the feeling to go outside. So everything felt foreign. So her grief was so complicated, not only from the two losses, but then the circumstances that she was surrounded with also were a new experience. So if if I didn't have that awareness from a grief counseling standpoint, I might have just kept trying to give messages and wonder why nothing was working. But instead, what I did was I rolled the session forward to a grief therapist and just said, I think you need a different kind of help. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set you up with someone and you're going to work with them for a couple of sessions and let's see how it goes from there. Because I think really our pulse should be to help, not to get so stuck on our own work that we think we can do the whole thing, which is why I think practitioners should have a really great set of other practitioners that we can go to when it's really clear that the client needs something beyond what we can offer. Right. Yeah. And do you ever find that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, people maybe who do need another form of counseling can become sometimes reliant on mediums or like if, if there's somebody that comes very often, very often, but they're relying on the medium to communicate with their past loved one. Um, you know, is there a time and a place when a medium, like, you know, this story that you gave sounds pretty clear cut to me, but is there ever a time when a medium, um, you know, should recognize that and maybe encourage the client to either seek counseling or to, I don't know, not be so reliant on the medium to have to come to get the messages from their past loved ones? Absolutely. And I also think it's dependent upon the client. So yes, I've had clients where I have I never require that people do multiple sessions, no matter which of the modalities that somebody's coming to me for. I will never say, okay, this is a six pack or this is something. It's up to their free will whether or not they need it. However, I need to be aware of what it is that they're seeking out. And if it becomes too frequent, then it's my responsibility and a really important one to indicate to them that they need. But see, then they might go to another medium and get messages. Right. So right. I, I and the pro, and the problem with that is um, it's such a big question, April, and such a good one. But um, I've also worked with people where g- regular grief counseling didn't work for them, but mediumship did. Like I had a client I worked for with over five years, and this is an extraordinary example of this. But she actually became mediumistic to the point where she could hear her son. So she'd gone through the grief therapy, but then she, and the reason why she came to me was grief therapy made her want to cross over and be with her son, which is a very normal thing for a parent that's lost a child. They'll go through that moment. So once she could understand that, that, that this connection was possible, because she came to me a true skeptic, um, she wanted to learn how to do it. So our sessions became partly communication and partly mediumship instruction. And then she got to the point where she could be on her own two feet and hear from her son. So she didn't need me to assist her. So that's an extraordinary example of like the opposite of it. But I think it's kind of a case to case thing. But for the most part, I would say we have to be careful about that. Yeah. And I think, you know, mediums can also really empower their clients, you know, like you said, to almost teach them how to be able to do that because, you know, everybody does have the capacity to be able to, you know, 
ask for signs, um, you know, hear their, their loved one either, you know, some people can very clearly hear, but, you know, also in different ways of communication with spirit that, you know, a medium can empower clients to look for those things. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I've never heard of the term soul gardener before. So what, <laughs> what is, what's soul gardening? What is that? What the heck is that? <laughs> well, it actually speaks to what you were just talking about. Um, so nice segue you, um, <laughs> I got to the point where like within every me, every medium is kind of like a great, hopefully a great wine, right? That there's a little bit of a varietal. Everybody focuses on something different. I found within my own work, I was very intrigued with family karma, like what runs in the family? What does that mean when something runs in the family and who are the game changers that come in to shift the karma and how do we empower those individuals to have the courage to know that they can. So the soul gardening is the umbrella of my shamanic training, my grief counseling. Um, my I've gone to a couple of different energy schools. I've studied hypnosis, um, remote viewing. I mean, all sorts of different modalities to give me different energy tools to empower people to work through the issues that come up with mediumship. Because within a mediumship session, um, you know, our desire as individuals within mediumship is to affirm the fact that we are eternal. <laughs> so because that's what our intention is, um, we will always be seeking out evidence to prove the fact that this is actually the soul that we're talking to. Now, the spirit world knows that they're eternal. So their goal is always healing. So there's that part once I started understanding that the spirit world is doing this primarily because they realize how much baggage we're carrying, I realized I had to figure out how to be able to be also available to people in a different context. Okay. And can you talk a little bit more about how the ancestors do work with us to try to heal some of that past karma? Absolutely. Um, well, I think the things that run in the family are the spiritual opportunities or what I like to call spiritunities within the family. So whether it's alcoholism or anger issues or um, lack of communication, um, all that get percolated within our relationships, those, per those particular issues um, will repeat because I believe that soul group is working to um, orchestrate how to evolve those issues within the family. And then once that particular pattern gets consciously dealt with and transformed, then the family can move on to the next level of evolution that they're, they're seeking. So to me, those, those are the best opportunities to notice. So it doesn't, it's not a life sentence that something runs in the family. It's a, it's a spirituality. It's, it's, it's something that's being gifted to that group to be able to unwrap. So our ancestors will show us what the patterns are. And if we could merely look at what those are and then take those as opportunities to, for our own personal involvement, I think we would be progressing a little bit more quickly than we are. And do you do most of that work through the shamanism and like sacred ceremony to call in the ancestors and do some sort of ritual around that with people? I do. I do more per, I want to empower the individual to do the work themselves. So what I do is, so within a mediumship session, if there's a pattern that shows up and then if it also hits with, or if it also um, connects with the soul that I'm working with, my client, then I have different energy medicine tools that I use to help them release the energy of that particular pattern within their own soul so they could try to walk forward without it or hold it differently. So it, there's, there, there's a couple of levels to it. They have to become conscious of the fact First of all, they have to understand that they can change it mm -hmm. and trust the fact that they they actually are the change. I mean, that brilliant statement, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. It's it, that's that's the future of what we need to vision. It's such a great statement. So once they have the awareness that it can change, um, then it's, it's really up to the individual how much they're willing to step into it. So by nature, I'm an optimist, but I'm such a cheerleader for people because that, that's where 
I wish we spent as much time on personal development that we do on all the other things that we worry about. Because I just feel like we've evolved tech technologically brilliantly, but I think personal evolution, we've just kind of keep putting a pause button on that one. And we, it needs, we need help. <laughs> right. So, so if the, so if we are, if the ancestors are constantly working through those that are in physical form to change some of those karmic patterns, um, and say a certain generation gets it. And you were talking about how that soul group then begins to evolve. Does that mean that if parts of the lesson are resolved and when they reincarnate back as a soul group that they are just kind of graduated to a different um, a different group of problems to begin to solve? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, that, that's a great way of saying it. So what will happen is if I'm sitting with someone who's a game changer and they make either a realization or it becomes apparent to me within the session that they've actually shifted a karmic pattern, I'll see the pattern show up as each one of the souls connected to that soul are manacled at the ankles. So it looks like they're all in leg irons connected to each other. And that's like my sign from the spirit world that this runs in the family or it's multiple generations. So the minute they make the, my client makes the realization, whether it's in an energy medicine work or it's within a mediumship session, all of the leg irons pop open. And then I can affirm to the person you have just shifted. And I just got goosebumps on it. I don't know. Sometimes people get mutual goosebumps, but, um, which is always my sign from the spirit world of like, absolutely. So um, the leg irons pop up and, and then I know that pattern has shifted. So then as long as that individual carries forward the new idea and isn't drawn back into the pattern, absolutely, then the group can advance to the next, you know, homework assignment. Okay. And, you know, one of the things that we're kind of touching upon uh, is really that being here on earth is a lot of work. <laughs> there's, work, there's work to be done. It's uh, There's aspects of it that are easy and that are fun, but I would say the majority of people that I have met have had a lot of work to do. Yes, and I also find a lot of the people who are the, the inspirational voice boxes for the soul are also people who got front-loaded pretty hard in the beginning of their life. And then... Right transmuted their own adversities to be at a point where now they can be of service to others because that story no longer defines them. It's one right. that they've learned how to kind of bound <laughs> and it's honored, but it's not the, you know, the walking truth. Yeah. Um, now I wanted to switch gears just a little bit because I was hoping we can talk a little bit about the afterlife conference. Mike and I are actually going to get a chance this year to go. Yay. So, yeah. So we're kind of excited. We've been interviewing a lot of you that are going to be there and, you know, we're, we're hoping to introduce ourselves if you guys have free time to say hello and, and all that. But, um, I see that you have a presentation that you're going to be doing on rituals for the day of the dead. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so every year, um, November 1st and November 2nd are set aside in the Hispanic cultures for celebration days of the dead. So November 1st traditionally is the celebration day for the children in the spirit world. And then November 2nd is for the rest of the ancestors. I love the fact that they give an entire day for kids because yeah. it's um, for the souls who's lost their children. It's just, it should just never happen, but it's, um, it's beautiful. And so what I love about the day of the dead celebration. And every year I do my own day of the dead celebration. So when the conference got moved from when we normally have it in the summer to the perfect timing of that weekend, I said to Terry, I said, far out, you know, this is great. <laughs> so, um, they have such a colorful humor, uh, um, a colorful, a humorous, um, an intelligent and a, and a healing practice of spending two days just grieving, celebrating, remembering, and honoring. And grief does not have to be 
crying your eyes out and pulling your hair out. It can be, but it also is just the taking the time to remember how the impact a soul has upon you. So I get to build an altar with the group, which is going to be amazing. And then the altar will be there for the conference. Wow. That's phenomenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what are your thoughts about the way in which our Western culture grieves? Um, I think we treat it like the elephant in the room. Mm. So in the book, so my publishers asked me in my book to write one chapter about grief. And I know I'm a grief counselor and yes, I can absolutely speak to grief. But instead, what I decided to do was highlight three mothers whose sons are in the spirit world and talk about their journey because it's, we don't know how to, instead of telling people what grief is like, I decided to say, this is what it looks like for these people. And this is what they say they would love us to do for them. Because to me, it was a better way of educating people about where we're missing out. Because the first year we're very good about maybe communicating with people. But after that, we want people to get over it. We don't want to talk about it anymore. We don't know what to say. We say the most inappropriate things um, because we're uncomfortable. And instead of empathizing and extending our soul to that soul and just giving them space to grieve, we want to try to control it because we're so afraid of death. Mm. Yeah. And and the thing that comes to mind for me is a little, I I think we're lacking a little bit in the community grieving or, you know, I mean, when you hear about the celebration or, you know, the ceremony of the day of the dead, uh, like you said, it doesn't always have to be about crying or mourning, but, uh, and maybe there is more of a movement that's happening that I'm not clearly aware of yet, but just in, you know, some of the traditions that I see a lot of my friends practice, um, you know, there's usually some sort of ceremony, whether it's a wake or it's a celebration of life. Um, you know, there's a burial, uh, you know, people here usually get a couple of days off from work to grieve, mm-hmm. um, unless they, you know, I, I forget what the, um, the family medical leave act, unless they, you know, take more time, but, you know, it seems to be more intimate, uh, individualized within friends and family when there's the passing and not really, uh, the community coming together or even our own culture coming together to have a day, you know, there's a day for everything, but what about in, in our Western culture to really have something like that? It just seems so foreign for us to do. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's, I I think it really initially stems from the fear we have about death. Yeah, it's just we do not know how to talk about it because we haven't taken the time or we're not encouraged to ask questions about it or to even contemplate it until something shocking happens. And if you also look at how the media portrays death. Um, it's either done in black humor or it's done so graphically that it's just massively disturbing. Right. So everything that we're taught is to, and of course, media has to sensationalize it, but I mean, they make it look just awful. And it's very rare that you get either a television show or something that really goes into the depth of grief. I mean, Six Feet Under, I think, did a pretty good job with looking at the idea of it and giving you all different versions of you know, people and how they deal with death. And, but there are things called now called death cafes, which was an organization that started the gentleman has since passed to the spirit world, but they're places where people just come together and talk about what they're grieving. And I've got, in fact, Terry and I are doing a workshop in Petaluma, um, in two weeks where it's just a weekend to allow your grief to flow, but it's also for CEU credits for practitioners to have different techniques to deal with people that are in grief. So I think the, the grander conversation is that we have to learn how to be uncomfortable. Um, and this speaks to anger. It speaks to a lot of the our emotions in general, but grief is absolutely a part of our soul that we just don't want to look at. Right. And what do you think really um, exacerbates the fear of death? Because nobody talks about it. Mm -hmm. And everything that we know is scary about it. And because everything that surrounds us is physical And because our eyes 
you know, it really, it really makes you question like what's true because a person who doesn't necessarily have a connection with their soul, more or less, who doesn't contemplate the fact that there is maybe a reason that things happen or maybe a spiritual aspect to themselves is going to absolutely look at the world as everything around me is physical and everything can be destroyed, taken or go away. So if we rely on our eyes, everything that we're surrounded by can change and then disappear or completely just be gone. That, that idea to the knowledge of our soul is completely contradictory. So without the awareness of the soul, we'll be terrified of death because to us it's an end. Right. But when we have that soul awareness, when we have that awareness that there is a spiritual aspect of us, and that's, I think, one of the one of the gifts of mediumship is the awareness that the soul continues. So then if that's the question, that's when the greater questions start being asked by the individual. So if we have some listeners that, you know, maybe are you know, awake on their spiritual path, but they are kind of shaking their heads and they're saying, I don't know what it is about death, but I'm still, I'm still petrified of it. I, you know, I listen to mediums, I go to mediums, um, you know, maybe there's people that believe in it, but they're still really afraid. Would you recommend that they begin to look more closely at what they are attached to so much in the physical realm? Or where does one begin to try to break some of that down? I would look at what that fear is more specifically. Like, is it the fear of the unknown? Because a lot of times our fear, fear is, fear is always future, always. It's what we don't know. And God love our mind, but our mind is mapped to figure things out. It's to take something, to find it and store it. So with the mind and with the emotions, you, or the finite self, as I call it, you cannot process death. You'll just be afraid of it. Because that's the only thing that your mind and your emotions know is is just fear. So really what the invitation of, of being afraid of death is a soul call. And that's when you say, okay, so clearly I'm afraid of it. Um, so, it, so on a practical level, you can make sure your business is taken care of. You can make sure that you have a will. You can make sure that you have everything that you do accountable. So you don't leave your loved ones with a whole bunch of things undone. Cause you don't know when that moment's going to happen. Um, you can close your relationship. You can make sure all your relationships are clean. You can leave as cleanly and as responsibly as possible because that would make the fear of death a little less because then you wouldn't leave any unfinished business. So that on a practical level would be very kind and considerate to the people around you. Then on a different level, I would look at what is the fear. And then I would start playing around with fear. Like what is fear? Is that just something that you don't know? And if you don't know something, then start practicing things you don't know just to engage it and find out what's the empowerment in embracing something you don't know. Right. And I think I've been pretty, you know, lucky personally, just on this whole journey with, you know, creating the documentaries that we did and being able to sit down across from so many people that have, you know, experience with out of body experience, remote viewing mediums, um, and all of that, that it's, it's really been, I know, helpful for me in my journey to seek that and investigate that and then try to find out some of the answers for myself. Um, because I know that personally, I, probably the majority of people that I've met, somebody usually has one of those quote unquote weird stories that they can't explain, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And it's true because all the paths that you're talking about, whether it's remote viewing, whether it's astral travel, past life regression, um, shamanic journeying, any of those things, it, meditation even in the easiest, just that idea of I am more than my physical self. And those explorations will certainly and there's also a great trend right now, and I'm a little kind of, um, I'm, I'm a little hesitant on this one, but there's a lot of people that are doing drug trips right now as a means to explore the unknown. Um, ayahuasca, which is called the vine of the dead, and in, in it's a, um, from the Amazon, um, is a really potent path. Um, it's called Vine of the Dead for a reason because it really takes your soul right to the edge of worlds. And the challenge with it is um, I don't mind people doing it. Um, I've studied shamanism. That's my shamanism, the Peruvian shamanism. So I understand the power of it. 
But equally, if you're not with people that understand how to track your soul, more or less, when you're out of body, if you're not with people that can follow you into the ethers and make sure that all of you comes home, you can come back altered. Yes. So I think there's very safe ways of exploring your soul. And if you're going to do any kind of other exploration, please make sure you're doing it with a shaman, like someone that isn't just someone that's taken a weekend course and decided they're a shaman. You want somebody who really knows what they're doing. And it shouldn't be a large group. It should be a small group of people. But it's um, it's an it's they're beautiful ways to explore your soul. And yeah, I'm, I'm gonna hoping that's the invitation. Yes. And I'm so glad that you said that. And I'm going to have to send this podcast over to uh, one of my colleagues um, who just had an experience like that with a client. She's an energy worker. And uh, one of her client had uh, been doing some ayahuasca ceremonies, but she came out of one and was like a complete wreck. Yep. And so when my friend was working on her energy, she said what she realized was that part of her soul hadn't reentered yep. and come back in. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and, and I, I'm so grateful that one of your colleagues is actually one that she is and it's a she, correct? Yes. Yes. That she's perceptive enough to one, know the energy of her client and know the difference between, because I had a client of mine whose brother did ayahuasca and did it enough times that he didn't come back and he ended up committing suicide. And that was never in his topography to begin with. Wow. It's just, he got out so much that he didn't come back. So it's, and you know, you try to, I try to explain it to people and I don't want to sound like this cautionary tale, but I don't think people, you know, they think, oh no, you're just being overly cautious. It's like, no, you don't, if you understand what it's like to watch a soul leave a body and come back, there's a responsibility. And that's why I studied shamanism for four years. I mean, I, I took every single class that I could take to make sure that I really could be fully responsible for someone going outside of their body. I have to be able right. to see them that way, you know, but, um, yeah, it's a, it's, and you can tell when people aren't a hundred percent, you can tell when something's off. And as practitioners, we equally need to know when we're not a hundred percent and know when not to work, but thank God, tell your client, give your, give her like a, a big congratulations on being that mindful. Yeah. She sounds I, fabulous. I will. And, um, you know, if there are energy workers that are listening that maybe experience something like that, that might not be trained in shamanism, but here they are, you know, like my friend is doing energy work and is noticing this. I know she has very good intuition and, you know, really did what she needed to do in that session. But yeah. what would you recommend for an energy worker that senses that in a session with a client that they know that they have done some journeying with uh, plants and that they can feel and sense that? Is there anything that they can do um, to help? I would suggest that they find a shamanic practitioner okay. because shamans, shamans are trained. A lot of the reason why the, the journeying and all those things have such primitive to me, have such primitive tools that you work with, like a drum and a rattle, is that it really brings us back to the beginning of when we would sit in ceremonial circles before we had a Judeo-Christian kind of imprint um, where we would, you know, work together in tribes. So I think since it's indigenous medicine, it speaks to all of our souls very, very rudimentarily. So um, I would suggest that just because a shaman, uh, most shamans should be able to handle that situation. And a soul retrieval would be a brilliant thing to do. I mean, that would be the, because essentially what a soul retrieval does is it goes back and figures out where did that kind of fragmentation happen and where did we go and how do we bring all of those elements back? Great. And just like you had, you know, probably your line of business cards of therapists and stuff to refer out, you know, as a medium, as therapists or energy workers, we should have business cards of shamans and mediums, yes. you know, vice versa. Yes. Um, to make sure that our clients are just getting that full healing. April, I so appreciate you saying that because I think it's, it, I, you know, as I, the word healer has always kind of vexed me a little bit because we don't really heal. We allow a sacred space through which the client can step into their own healing. And I think 
it's important for our ego to stay out of the work because we're not doing these magnificently brilliant things. We are creating a space for magic to happen. And yes. in that context, we have to know when we're over our head, when a client, maybe our personalities just don't match and they're not getting what they deserve. In that instance, we should be more than willing to ref either give them back what they've invested and find someone that can help them. Their needs should be much more vital than our ego. And no matter how long you've been doing the work, you will always encounter those opportunities <laughs> to come from your soul on the truth of it. And um, I really appreciate your integrity. You sound, you, I, I look forward to meeting you because you, you really walk the talk very well. Yes. Well, thank you. And, and I would say, you know, if people are looking for a type of healer or a shaman, you know, I think it's important for people to really interview those people, those practitioners. And I would say that if, you know, our listeners who are listening now, that if you do hear somebody say what Austin just said, that, you know, in so many words that we are more of the vessel and not the healer, but we, you know, are kind of that, that, uh, what, what was the word that you use? We are kind of the people that can allow this magic to come through, but we are not the actual healers. That is a very good sign as a client of somebody that you might want to work with, because that tells me that they get it. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Because otherwise what they're doing is hooking you into their, their ability. Um, I had a client a while ago who had come to me like, you know, every, some people come to me like once a year or twice a year is kind of like a spiritual check-in. I hadn't seen her for a while. And she came in with her tail between her legs. And I was like, what is going on with you? And she's like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. And I said, that's great. Find other people. So what's going on? And she says, well, I've been seeing other practitioners. And I said, great. She goes, well, one in particular. And I said, okay. And she said, yeah. And I spent $10,000 and I, I could speak. I said, what happened? She says, well, she told, she said she was really good, but then she told me I had a curse. And then she told me I had to come back. And, and this woman who was very, very sweet, the practitioner was good enough to hook her in, but then kept telling her that she needed her to be able to get better. That's not the case. Nobody's going to, practitioners can support you, but our, it's not our job to make you better. You have to do your own homework. You have to be, it's a, it's a, you know, and I will do my part is part of this. You have to be willing to take on what comes out of a session. So it just, it just made me sad that she um, had spent all that money. But wow. she learned. She learned. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and I like what you had to say, too, is that there there is responsibility for the individual to put in their work and to own it. You know, use these healers, these mediums, these different avenues as tools, you know, to kind of get you there on the way. But ultimately, it is up to the individual soul to work through that. It is. And then in that sense, we're empowering them, which what, which what we should work. It's, and it's funny, empowering is such a beautiful word, but essentially what we're doing is reminding them that they have all of that within themselves. And we all get to a point where the circumstances of our life are overwhelming and we don't feel capable and we do need a hand of another to walk us through a darker time, but we're just reminding them of their soul. Yeah. Now I'd like to bring our listeners over to your website uh, because you have some fun stuff on there. <laughs> um, and it's austinwells.com in case people are listening and have their laptops right there where they can actually open up your website, but you have some classes and workshops and you have some cool card decks. Um, so I'd like you to just tell people a little bit about your website and what they can uh, get from that. Okay. Um, I, uh, all, of course, all of my services are available there and I do energy medicine, soul gardening, uh, mediumship, energy healing, soul searching, lots of stuff. <laughs> um, and, uh, that also may be, I may be adding things to it with the book's arrival, um, that will fit within the paradigm and the, the flow of the book. Um, the cards I've had a lot of fun with, I developed two decks of cards. One is a deck of card called the divine spark cards. And those are a mediumship development deck, more or less. They help mediums 
have the courage to ask the spirit world bigger questions to get more evidence. Um, But they've also now transitioned into grief counselors using them with their clients to get them to talk about their, you know, loved one in the spirit world, uh, which makes it kind of interactive and fun. But also I have people using the cards at family gatherings like Christmas and Thanksgivings and celebrations where people put a card and then they start remembering about the soul, um, just by the card that they pick. So those are fun. And then I developed the divine, um, insight cards. And those are, I love tarot decks. I've grown up with them, but, um, I wanted to create a deck that anybody could read. So they are, um, pictures that represent who knows? And I don't have a descriptor book because I don't want to tell people what the cards are. I want people to learn to trust their soul senses to be able to discover what the cards are for themselves. So the fun thing is, is one person will see one thing in a picture and then another person will see something completely different. And that's perfect. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So those cards have been very successful and lots of fun to watch people use them in different ways. Well, wonderful. Well, Austin, it's been a a great chat here. Um, I loved having you as a guest on our show and you definitely have to be in touch with us when you are ready to release your new book and we will have you back on. April, I would love that. And thank you for being such a conscientious, prepared and loving host, Tess. Thank you. You're (laughs) fabulous. If you want more information about our films, visit our website, path11productions.com, to purchase DVDs or to rent and stream each film. You can also find our trilogy of films on iTunes, Amazon Prime, and Gaia.com. You can still use our smartphone app for both Android and iPhones. Just search for Path 11 in the Google Play App Store, or if on an iPhone, look for Path 11 in the iOS App Store. Catch you next time. Mm